साथियों भारतीय जनता पार्टी फ्रेंड्स द भारतीय जनता पार्टी नेवर हेजिटेट्स इन टेकिंग बिग एंड टफ डिसीजन इन फेवर ऑफ द नेशन पीछे नहीं हटती रिफॉर्म Reform, perform, transform. Based on this principle, we will stride forward even better. Globalize. Indians are voting, and as the world's largest democracy, this is going to be a very lengthy exercise. Starting from April 19th to June 1st, about 970 million eligible voters will cast their votes, and there are more than one million polling stations that have been set up. This is globalized where we discuss security policy. And as far as Indian elections are concerned a lot is being discussed but we are going to stick to foreign policy to security policy and instead of what should change we are going to discuss what could and probably would change after the Indian elections. I am Isha Bhatia Sanan I am senior editor here at Deutsche Welle. And precisely to that point what does foreign policy play in Indian elections and What does it what impact does Indian elections have on foreign policy? How is that being seen by leaders around the world? I'm William Bluecraft, a security reporter with DW. And we have two great guests joining us to exactly those and other points. We have Swasti Rao, she is an associate fellow at the Europe and Eurasia Center at the Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies, which is part of India's Defense Ministry. She joins us from New Delhi. And our second guest today is Dr. Kshitij Bajpai. He is senior research fellow for South Asia in the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House. He's joining us from London. So Swasti, let's start with you. For the new government, what is the biggest foreign policy challenge that the new Indian government will have to face? So uh, the biggest challenge would be to uh, sort of continue uh, safeguarding India's uh, national interests in a very uncertain world uh, because just as we were coming out of the covid pandemic and all the damage that it uh, sort of uh, incurred upon The, the entire, uh, so to say, you know, India's econ- economic profile and uh, the SMEs, etc. I mean, you're coming out of that, and then India was doing reasonably well, and then we had the Ukraine war, and the Ukraine war landed us in a different kind of a vulnerable spot because we were neutral, of course, but that neutrality was uh, a active kind of a neutrality where we stood by peace and we tried to call for humanitarian, we, I mean, basically uh, give humanitarian aid, etc. We also, I think, not many people understand that we also sort of uh, by allowing uh, by by per- purchasing all the russian oil we allowed the g7 price cap to work etc so all i'm saying is that it's a diff- difficult kind of a, a balancing act that india has been doing and i think india will have to continue doing that balancing act after the new government uh, comes into place because i don't see the world uh, problems or the uncertainty etc going anywhere uh, in the in the near future so Asi, let's let's stick with you because you are in new delhi um these foreign policy challenges you just laid out Ukraine and Russia um and then the knock on effects the economic effects things like oil energy what role if any are those playing in the election campaign uh well um uh, for once um, you know india has taken um, i would say a lot of pride in very successfully conducting the g20 uh you know summit and india was the president last year and if you know that india sort of positioned itself as this bridge between the east and the west and north and the south and uh, in in that sense uh, whatever was happening the geopolitical geostrategic uh, changes happening from ukraine onwards um you know it they've been an enabler of conversations in many ways so india and at the same time, I mean, there's been very, very close to the West. I mean, that our relationship has been growing by leaps and bounds. If you've been noticing uh, how close we are now to the U.S. in terms of all the different agreements that we have struck, so this kind of a momentum with U.S. on the one hand and with Europe again, uh, Europe, you know, France has been emerging as a major defense partner, and as our uh, arms imports from Russia has been, you know, going down. So in the middle of all of that, we've had a very successful G20 presidency. I'm also aware that a lot of people would criticize. Uh, that G20 presidency for not really um, uh, you know berating uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine but that has been India's foreign uh, you know um, official foreign policy which is that we we certainly are mindful of our historical and important relationship with Russia and we need Russia for a variety of our foreign policy imperatives so we have basically been trying to be as an enabler of conversations and uh, trying to stand up for peace rather than war and this has struck a chord i would say because the average urban indian voter especially urban 
is extremely mindful of these things. And, uh, uh, you know, the government has uh, left no stone unturned to try to project it as India's successful movement. And in, in, through my writings, I, would, I have called it India's intersectional global movement, right, that India has tried to still maintain a very good economic growth despite all the uh, dampening uh, geopolitical developments uh, around the world. So, yes, I mean, India does, that's how it is, uh, it is sold in India. And I think it also strikes a, a chord because it it is then coupled with a lot of other things that are happening inside of India. And so I think the government has been able to come up with this good packaging and also you know, positioning itself as a credible player in a very uncertain world. So that has clicked, yes. Shetit Swasti has been talking about G20. Now, I was there and I can confirm that it was like this big fanfare where everybody was talking about, uh, wow, the whole world is here and this is a huge thing for India. And Swasti said that um, that actually led to the urban voters talking about India's position in the world. How do you see it sitting in London? Now, from a distance, how do you see, did it really benefit India? And for the next governments to come, is it really going to make a big difference? Well, I think it's an interesting question. I mean, traditionally, it's, an, it's important to remember that historically foreign policy has not really been a prominent uh, electoral issue in Indian elections. Uh, but what, what, what the Modi government has really managed to do is make Indians care more about India's place in the world under how his rule, India's status has been elevated and how it's developed a more assertive foreign policy. And again, we saw this with the G20 presidency, which it's important to remember was actually delayed uh, by a year to bring it closer to the election. Uh, and I think that we're going to probably see something similar for the for the for the next election, the 2029 election, where India there's a bid for India to uh, to host the COP climate change conference uh, in in the, in the pre previous year, uh, 2028. So you can see that you know the Modi government is really really trying to leverage foreign policy accomplishments for electoral gain. So whether it be through the G20 presidency or its bid to host the 2036 Olympics or its space program, uh, it, it's really trying to project this image of, of India uh, uh, being a country in a geopolitical sweet spot, or as the government refers to it, it being an Amrit Kal or a critical period. So that's very much what what the project, what it's trying to project uh, domestically. I think from, from a... Uh, uh, from from a you know global vantage point, I think uh, it, it is true to a degree. Uh, India is seen to be a potential beneficiary of the push to try and de-risk or, or or diversify supply chains away from China. We're seeing Elon Musk is going to be visiting uh, India this week. Uh, so the, so particularly in the area of critical emerging technologies, India is seen as a potential beneficiary of tensions in the U.S.-China relationship. So I think there are. Uh, I think it is. It, there's a degree of rhetoric uh, that outweighs the substance or the reality. But, uh, yeah, I think in India is in, uh, in a stronger position uh, or has been over the last decade or so under the current government. So just let me follow up with you on that, because as Swasti said, India under Modi has tried to position itself as this bridge between east, west, north, south. How For how much longer can Modi get away with that? Um, is at some point they're going to have to be a decision that it can't just be friends of the West and friends of 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 the global South. It can kind of be a friend to everybody. Um, try to bring people together. Will it at some point have to make these decisions in these tensions between more of a Western outlook and more of uh, a look towards towards Russia and to other parts of the globe that are decidedly against the West or looking to create some other kind of alternative? So I think on paper or in theory, India is well positioned to play the role of a, of a, of a peacemaker or a bridging power or, or a mediator, through, given its longstanding commitment to strategic autonomy or multi or omni alignment in its foreign policy, which has allowed it to you know, engage all major poles of influence in the international system. And under the Modi government, this has been reframed as a concept of India as a Vishwamitra or a friend of the world. However, I think it as you allude to, there there is a difference between being a friend of the world and helping the, the world make friends with each other. Uh, so I think that there are questions about India's willingness to play a mediating role, you know, akin to the role that it played, say, to, uh, said, uh, say in the 1950s, where it played a prominent role during the Korean War, the French-Indo-China War. And I think the best example of this is what we've seen in, in the Ukraine conflict. So aside from Prime Minister Modi's much-touted statement of now is not the era of war, India's role has frankly been quite limited, and it's driven largely by self-interest. Uh, it's been a beneficiary of access to discounted Russian crude, for instance, uh, which has jumped from about 2% of its total imports to over 20% after the war, but uh, at its peak. So, uh, I, yeah, I, I would say that India's 
role is still relatively quite limited in terms of being uh, able to play the role of a bridging power or, or, or a mediator. Uh, and I think if push comes to shove, if we see an escalation of the war, the conflict in, in Ukraine of, of a, a, or, or uh, a conflict between the U.S. and China over Taiwan, I think India will be placed in an increasingly difficult position and be forced to, to choose sides. Chitit, I would like to understand how does foreign policy really play into domestic policy uh, politics? Because um, you got to get the voters, right? And I don't think there's been any other foreign uh, minister before Jay Shankar who's become like a poster boy or the youth icon where the youth is really interested in listening to what he's saying. So how does that really play into domestic politics? So I think it, uh, it clear. I mean, there are four, I think, key factors which explain the current government's strength the Modi government strength. And, I, you know, uh, one is its reform and development agenda. Uh, one is, I think, the Modi brand. Uh, one aspect is the Hindutva or Hindu nationalism uh, ideology. And then the fourth is is about India pursuing a more muscular and assertive foreign policy. Uh, so whether it be uh, in, in its response to uh, a terrorist attack, which we saw uh, in, in 2019, the Pulwama terrorist attack in Kashmir um, in February 2019, or, or it it be its G20 presidency or it be its space program or it's a more assertive response uh, to uh, or, or the downturn that we saw in, say, in India-Canada relations last year uh, amid allegations of Indian complicity in the uh, uh, killing of this uh, Sikh Canadian national on Canadian soil. I think we've clearly seen India try to assert itself as, as, a, uh, as a more prominent global power. Um, and, and again, uh, this was very evident during its G20 presidency, where it was talking about so-called Indian solutions to global problems, whether it be on climate, whether it be on global health, whether it be on digital public infrastructure. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think uh, the the, uh, the rhetoric that we saw coming out of the G G20 uh, is very much applicable to, to your question about it's, it was not just about bringing India to the world, but bringing the world to India, making Indians far more aware of the country's place in the world, and uh, uh, how it's 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 able to project its power. Uh, and and it's yeah, as I said uh, at the as earlier, I think. Foreign policy has historically not been a, a prominent electoral issue in Indian elections, but under the Modi government, under Jay Shankar uh, as the external affairs minister, it has managed to ma elevate the, the prominence of foreign policy uh, in, in uh, electoral uh, discussions. So, Asti, how does how do some of those points look from your vantage point in New Delhi? Well, I'll just add a few things to what Chitta just said. Um, see, India has a 1.4 billion people, you know, 1.4 billion strong market. So one of the things that uh, why the West is courting India, if you'd like to, you know, use that word, also comes from the fact that we are a biggest we are a, we are the biggest market, you know, and also growing and also a young market. And uh, we've uh, tried to sort of, uh, you know, we've been successful. And if you look at the last 10 years of Modi's rule, uh, you can't take away from him the fact that it was under his rule that we first, you know, from the 11th largest to the fifth largest economy, and now we are on our way to becoming the third largest economy. Uh, so the West is wanting to give us uh, investments, etc. We are already uh, navigating, uh, you know, um, the free trade agreements. The biggest one is there with the EU and the UK. The other thing is that look at India's geographical position in the Indo-Pacific. I think one of the things that is very popular in India that strikes that chord in India is that the West needs India today more than India needs the West. And uh, it is not completely wrong. Yes, it does add to a lot of rhetoric, uh, you know, and all countries have this, uh, some bit of that national rhetoric to whip up before elections. So I don't think, um, in, you know, there's any exception to that here, as uh, you know, in that sense. But for sure, right now, if you look at Indo-Pacific, how Indo-Pacific as a, as a theater is becoming important, you know, you look at countries like the US, the great power contestation, Chitish mentioned that. And, uh, you know, all that, that India is trying to do. So even when it comes to quoting, for example, countries in the Pacific region or the developing economies of the global south, you do see that India has a reputational advantage vis-a-vis -vis China, right? So India does not come with the same deep pockets, but has a reputational advantage. And therefore, the developmental programs, the triangular cooperation programs that India has with the West, for example, with France or uh, with countries like Germany uh, or, the, or, you know, regions like European Union then uh, have more potential to become much more successful because, you know, it rides on India's reputational advantage. And um, like I said, that one of the things that really pushes India to uh, adhere to this kind of multi-alignment is, of course, our big weapons dependence. And, um, um, you know, Ukraine war in that sense has been uh, a 
pretty much a game changer because in the years of the Ukraine war, we have not really uh, placed any significant important order, you know, with Russia. And this has not really been the case earlier. Russia is um, under sanctions and one doesn't really know will, will it have the spare capacity to sort of give us the spare parts. Our S-400s have not come. Uh, they were supposed to come in two, two, uh, 2022. But uh, now the latest um, estimates that we've received from them say that it would not come before 2026 and the third quarter of 2026. So that does raise a lot of problems. Uh, so if you ask me just to sort of sum this particular point up, when it comes to weapons dependence, and which is one of the biggest factors of why India is multi-aligned, you see that most of the orders that we have placed with Russia have been cancelled in the name of indigenization. All the important orders, whether it's the Rafale jets, whether it's the, you know, the engines, the engine platforms for aircrafts, for submarines, uh, you know, conventional submarines, etc. All of that has been struck with the West in line with how India's defense acquisition procedure has been uh, evolving after 2016. So, uh, I, I often say that, yes, on the face of it, if you want to understand India, you and especially the foreign policy part, uh, there is multi-alignment for sure. But uh, what you, you also have to add there is that this multi-alignment is not an equal distribution. Uh, you see very, very clearly that when it comes to extremely significant things, whether it's the economy, investments, diaspora, you know, weapons, technology, etc., you know, we have uh, we've been working much more closely than the West uh, than ever before. And it also reflects that India is mindful of how uh, the Russian, you know, the war in Ukraine is pushing Russia with China. And this is, of course, to our to, to our disadvantage. We would not have liked that, but there's very little I, in my analysis that we can do about it because regardless of the outcome of the war in Ukraine, uh, Russia is going to get further pushed with China in many, many ways and, and, and ways which are very ir irreversible, you know. So I think that these are um, extremely important calculus for India to, to factor in. But at the same time, mm. the, the uh, you know, the rhetoric, the, um, I mean, at the level of semantics, you know, uh, I think we would definitely uh, engage Russia. Uh, we all we have all the reasons to engage Russia. We would uh, go on with our policy of multi-alignment. But like I said, that it has to ha come with that little bit of a developed understanding that it is not an equal distribution. Right. Those, those S-400s you're talking about, the, the surface-to-air missiles that India has relied upon, is just one example of uh, yes. Indian-Russian uh, defense relations, which, as you note, um, are on the decline due to the war in Ukraine. So doesn't that sort of contradict a little bit what you said earlier about uh, the West needs India more than India needs the West? If Russia is becoming less of a player for India, it relies more on the West, especially when it comes to security. And while India, I can imagine, doesn't want to see escalation between China and the U.S., um, also doesn't want to see China become a growing power and might need the U.S. and the West to sort of check China's growth. So how does that square with what you said about the West needing India more than India needing the West? The Russia's war in Ukraine has uh, made India's imports from Russia uh, go down. Yes, that is definitely a fact, but that is not the whole picture. Uh, India remains one of the largest weapons importers in the world. And we have two unsettled borders and we have fought so many wars, you know, four wars with Pakistan and two, three, four, um, you know, major issues with China. So, of course, you know that India is very much dependent on, on weapons. And what had unfortunately happened in the earlier era, when I say the earlier era, I mean the Congress era, is that despite um, all the efforts, we saw that instead of developing our own indigenous program, we got more and more dependent on foreign uh, players. And this is one thing that has been flagged time and again by defense experts as to India cannot really become self-reliant in this sector of, uh, you know, uh, of security and defense until we also give a substantial amount of our time and resources, uh, you know, to, to, the, to the indigenous sector. And Particularly, this push came after 2016, because 2016 and 2020, these two years, the Defense Acquisition Procedure, so DAP, it underwent, you know, two reforms. And under those reforms, it was made very, very clear that any, um, you know, uh, any defense deal that India enters into has to have a certain amount of indigenized content, right? So it has to have some indigenous content. Then it the focus was more from earlier buyer-seller kind of a relationship where India was only buying and the others were selling. From that buyer-seller relationship, the focus shifted to joint production. 
and transfer of technology. You see that all the major defense deals that are being negotiated right now have a very um, important component of DOT, some degree of DOT for sure. And this is where the future is. So that is what I'm saying that when I say that West needs India, yes, let me complete that India also needs the West, but it is something which is very, very, um, you know, reciprocal. So um, that is what makes, uh, you know, this relationship, I would say, special. And But at the same time, I think West has also become mindful of the fact that India's engagement with Russia will continue for, for different reasons. I have not listed those, reasons, those reasons yet. Defense is, of course, one. But there are other reasons. I mean, India's outreach to Central Asia, India's uh, sort of relevance in Afghanistan or uh, the INSTC or the our investments in Chabahar. India is also a member of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So we have been using Russia to balance China. And India's foreign policy imperative is to also keep the larger Asia multipolar and there Russia will remain an important partner regardless of how much it gets pushed with China so we do take care of that we do recalibrate but at the same time you cannot wish that away so that will continue and what I see today is that there is a more acceptance when it comes to the West of uh, of these uh, you know security imperatives of these foreign policy geopolitics imperatives that India has and at the same time India then is also somewhere you see uh, that for a long time this entire perception around West was that oh we can't trust them. Why? Because we can trust Russia. So that was a very, I would say, uh, at the level of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, the popular, uh, so to say, populist, uh, so to say, expressions that you would keep seeing coming uh, from Indian public and a lot of, you know, right. uh, the strategic uh, commentary. But I think I see that changing as well. Yeah, back to you. Uh, Shitej, I'd like to come to you now. Now, um, Swasti has in detail, she's talked about the defense uh, policy and the main reason behind that, of course, being the border conflicts. Now, it is not really uncommon to hear about border issues right before the elections. Now, borders uh, with Pakistan and China both are sensitive issues. And um, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has recently commented on China in an interview with the Newsweek. So he's talked about restoring peace through diplomatic channels. And it is very rare that you see uh, Narendra Modi talk about China so openly. Uh, but it is also being interpreted as uh, the softening of tone. How do you see it? So I think there's several issues here. So first of all, you know, national security was very much a key theme for the 2019 election, and that was for several reasons. So it came in the aftermath of the Pulwama uh, terrorist attack in Kashmir of, in February of that year, uh, to which India then responded with airstrikes inside Pakistani territory. Uh, it was the first time it carried out such operations since 1971. Uh, it was also uh, so it was basically a time when India was trying to burnish its credentials, its national security credentials. It, it used this rhetoric of India, of Modi as a chokidar or a, or a watchman. It was also a time when the Indian economy wasn't in great shape. So there was more emphasis that was being placed on national security. This time around, the situation is a bit different. The Indian economy is in much stronger shape, at least on paper it is, it's, uh, as we've heard. It's the world's third largest, uh, I mean, it's the world's fifth largest economy. It's, uh, it's on world's fastest growing major economy. It's, it's emerged as a darling of foreign investors amid this push to try and de-risk or diversify supply chains away from China. Uh, so the government doesn't need to lean on national security to the same degree that it did in the 2019 election. This doesn't mean that national security doesn't matter. Uh, 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 relations with Pakistan remain precarious uh, despite a ceasefire along the line of control since 2021. Uh, relations with China, as we've uh, discussed, are in a new normal or have been in a new normal since the Galwan Valley clashes uh, that we saw in 2020. Uh, and we've just seen, for instance, the Congress Party manifesto makes specific reference, uh, uh, the, uh, the Congress Party being the opposition party, makes specific reference to border tensions with China. It calls for an increase in defense spending, calls for a national security strategy. So I think it is an issue. National security is an issue in this election. but. Uh, I think for political purposes, it's not as significant as as it was, say, in the 2019 elections, uh, both given uh, as a result of the terrorist attack that we saw in, in India a few months beforehand, but also because it can it can you know look, uh, lean on other issues, uh, other factors. So the uh, the economy being in stronger shape, the Hindutva agenda with the consecration of the Ram Mandir and a string of other policies. The government has pursued, uh, you know, a more uh, you know muscular foreign policy or uh, assertive foreign policy that we've seen with the G20 presidency in other uh, areas. So I think uh, it, it, the government doesn't need to lean on 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 uh, on uh, on its uh, national security credentials to the same degree that it did in the 2019 election. So just um, following up on that, 
given the strength that Modi has going into this election, of course, we don't know how things are going to go, but he has, stands a very good shot of becoming, of, of re remaining as prime minister. Does that, for, looking from the outside, uh, how should Western leaders uh, be looking at that next government that may very likely be a continuation of the Modi government? Um, is it just the new boss, same as the old boss, or is <laughs> does does a, 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 a another term mean something different in relations with India? So I think a, th a potential, uh, uh, a, a, a reiterated potential uh, th a third term Modi government and probably a likely third term Modi government. Uh, on the positive side, we, we should expect a high degree of continuity. Uh, you know, there are probably going to be some changes of personnel, some cabinet uh, in terms of cabinet appointments. But I think on the negative side, I think the downturn in India-Canada relations that we saw last year uh, amid allegations of this uh, alleged Indian complicity in, in the murder of this Canadian national, Hardeep Singh Nijar, on, on Canadian soil, I think it shows uh, signs of a, of a more assertive and muscular Indian foreign policy. It shows an India that is more prone to taking offense to actions that challenge its sovereignty and status. Um, and in this, for you know, for example, could pose a risk for countries which have a large Indian diaspora population. India has the world's largest diaspora, 18 million people. Uh, this has, you know, historically been a source of strength. We've seen the very warm welcome that Prime Minister Modi has received when he's traveled abroad uh, from uh, overseas Indian communities. But it could also be a potential risk uh, for for uh, uh, when when certain communities are engaged in allegedly anti anti India activities. So I think there are certain risks on the horizon. I think the other issue is, uh, you know, the elephant in the room perhaps is concerns about democratic backsliding, which has been expressed by several uh, Western governments. Most recently, the U.S. Uh, acting deputy chief of mission was summoned. Um, after the U.S. State Department voiced complaints over the, the uh, arrest of uh, Arvind Kejriwal, the leader of the Aam Admi Party. Um, I mean, frankly, I think as long as India continues to be seen as a bulwark against the rise of China, concerns about democratic backsliding will continue to be downplayed, at least at an official level. Uh, so, you know, India's imperfect democracy trumps uh, China's one-party authoritarian state. Um, and I think, you know, in that context, India is seen to be a country that offers a more benign worldview, which is uh, non-Western, but not explicitly anti-Western, unlike other countries such as China, Russia, or Iran. Uh, so in that context, I think over the short term, it, it won't have an immediate impact on India's relations with the West uh, under a potential third-term Modi government. Uh, but I think over the longer term, there are certain risks on the horizon. You know, the, the, the West loves to tout India's credentials as the world's largest democracy as one of its reasons or one of the pillars of engagement with the country. Uh, so if we see a potential erosion of India's democratic credentials, that will have implications for, you know, how Indian democracy is viewed and perceived globally and also, you know, the potentially prompting the West to review its cooperation with the country, particularly in, in sensitive areas such as intelligence cooperation. Chidit, you mentioned Nijar briefly. Now we got these accusations of extrajudicial killings in Pakistan orchestrated uh, by the Modi government. Um, now, Pakistan has usually been uh, talked about before the elections, but as you said, this time around, India didn't really need a security issue uh, that had to be discussed. And now all of a sudden we see these accusations. What do you make of that? To be... Uh... I mean, I can't uh, uh, talk about the, you know, the veracity of the, uh, the accusa uh, accusations, but uh, it, it, to put it bluntly, it's not frankly surprising. You know, India has uh, engaged in intelligence operations and, and, uh, and I would add to that potentially targeted killings in its neighborhood for years, if not decades. The Niger case was a game changer of sorts because this was uh, an operation that was potentially carried out uh, it, on 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 the, on the soil of a Western country, of a NATO member state, of a member a country that is a member of the Five Eyes, so you know uh, there's a one could say there's an unsaid rule that you it's okay if you're carrying out such operations there, but don't carry them out here. So that I think that that's what made why there was far more noise associated with the allegations of Indian complicity in, in the assassination in in the in the in Canada and the attempted assassination in in the U.S. So I think uh, on, on, on the issue of Pakistan more specifically, it is, uh, I find it quite interesting on how, when we talk about Indian foreign policy, how little Pakistan tends to come up nowadays um, in the discussion. 
in, in, in some attempts, it, it reflects Indian foreign policy more broadly, that it, it's a, it's attempt to transcend the region. So when we talk about India, we're talking about India's relations with major powers, Russia, the European Union, China, the United States, its position on issues of global governance, on, on climate, its role, at, it's a G20 presidency, it's, it's a, uh, and less so about what are its relations with its neighbors. Um, I think on Pakistan, I think there were some hopes or uh, for an improvement in relations if, if Nawaz Sharif had, had come back as prime minister uh, uh, following the Pakistani elections, which took place in February, uh, given that relations have historically improved when, when Nawaz Sharif has been in power. Uh, Modi visited Pakistan in 2015 uh, when uh, Nawaz Sharif was uh, prime minister. We had the Lahore bus diplomacy back in 1999, uh, again, when Nawaz Sharif was prime minister. But instead, what we have now is a very fragile government in Islamabad, uh, led by Shabazz Sharif, Nawaz's uh, brother, with a limited mandate. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously you have the, the, the so-called establishment or the military and intelligence services, which are continuing to pull the strings behind the scene on issues of foreign policy and, and, and national security. So that very much limits the space for rapprochement. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, a, a potential watch point will be to see whether a third term or a potential third term Modi government with a strengthened mandate is will be in a stronger position to try and uh, extend an olive branch uh, to Pakistan. I mean, I don't hold out uh, high hopes of that. But historically, Indian prime ministers have tried to improve relations with Pakistan as they approach the end of their tenure. I mean, uh, Modi would be potentially entering his third term. So could we have a, you know, uh, only Nixon could go to China moment. So Modi with his strong Hindu nationalist, Hindutva credentials, uh, his, uh, you know, uh, hyper-nationalist foreign policy, is he in a stronger position to to, uh, to, to put out an olive branch to Pakistan. I think it's still a long shot, but uh, it, it is an important uh, yeah, I mean, th th this point. doesn't seem to be going in the direction of uh, being friends with Pakistan. I mean, the Indian government has, of course, denied it. Uh, but even if the accusations were to be true, wouldn't that actually help the government win the election? Because uh, the defense minister, Rajnath Singh, had said that terrorists, they run uh, uh, away to Pakistan, and if need be, we will enter Pakistan and kill them. And this is like keeping up with their promise, if this were to be true. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's in line with a, a, a you know more muscular foreign policy. So what what we saw saw from 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 previous uh, military uh, uh, operations against uh, Pakistan back in 2019, I think that they they're maintaining that level of, of rhetoric. But it's also I think interesting to note that of all the countries that Pakistan shares borders with. It, it, relations are, or the, the the border is most stable with India at the moment. We've had a, a ceasefire in place since 2021. If you look at, we saw a few months ago what happened on on the Iran-Pakistan border. Uh, uh, tensions have been flaring up on the Afghan-Pakistan border. So I think both sides have uh, been exercising a degree of restraint. Uh, I think it's also going to be uh, interesting to see what happens on the domestic political front in India. So, uh, and here I'm thinking about Kashmir. Uh, holding, uh, uh, if we see the reinstatement of statehood in, in Kashmir, for instance, uh, National Assembly elections being held in Kashmir, I, I, is that a potential uh, off-ramp uh, to, to try and uh, reinitiate discussion or dialogue between uh, Islamabad and New Delhi? I think that'll be an important watch point. Well, when the Pakistan-India border is maybe the most stable border, I don't know what that says. So that might be a very low bar that we're trying to get over. We do need to wrap yes. things up, but Swasti, I'd, I'd love, if you could just very briefly respond to that, since you are in, in India, um, to any of those points uh, that Chitej uh, yeah. has made, especially regards to Pakistan, because Pakistan, once upon a time, was the issue, and now it seems, as, as Isha has said, it's not really there. The well, uh, yes, Pakistan first. I think that is Pakistan's own doing in many ways. So Pakistan has been steadily on the path of uh, Islamization. You know, you saw that happening under Imran Khan when he when the Sarkar in Medina and all that uh, rhetoric became extremely entrenched. Uh, he gave a free pass to all the radicals and Pakistan is in bad shape. Uh, whether you look at it, uh, you know, socially um, or if you look at it in terms of uh, uh, the, the their economic problems, I mean, you we can have another show on how uh, hollowed out is Pakistan uh, economically as a state and how much, um, you know, he has, it has to sort of go to all these different power, uh, you know, countries and centers and beg for uh, uh, being bailed out. So that's one. I think Pakistan's own doing, number one. I think when it comes to India's uh, position, it has been very, very clear that India will not budge from uh, this position, this very stated position that uh, you have to stop terror to start talks and cross-border terrorism has been a problem. India has been... Uh, 
I mean, I think the victim of that of that particular cross border, uh, you know, actions by Pakistan for a very long time. And we've made it very, very clear. So when you say that Pakistan is not figuring as much, uh, well, yes, what we really do bother about is uh, the fact that Pakistan has China's back. Okay, uh, that is something which uh, which obviously opens a different kind of a plethora of. Uh, um, you know, considerations for us. But otherwise, just as a state, Pakistan is a nuisance value, more of a nuisance value. We've always been trying to, uh, you know, have a dialogue, but the dialogue will have to start from ending of, of the terror activity. So we've been very, very clear on that. And I think that suffices, uh, number one. The other thing about Pakistan is that, uh, you know, when, when uh, Taliban came to power, Pakistan thought that it was its moment to try and internationalize, you know, all the Kashmir and this and that. But then you today see that uh, Taliban had never really criticized the application of Article 370. So that was something that kind of flew right into the face of Pakistan's uh, uh, decades-old, um, uh, I would say, uh, tactics to keep internationalizing the Kashmir issue, etc. So, I mean, of course, we are dealing with Pakistan in our own way. It doesn't figure as much because, of course, the bigger problem, the elephant in the room for us is China, which is a much more complicated game because we, China is also one of our top most trading partners. And uh, when, uh, if you say, uh, I mean, very quickly, um, I think, um, uh, you know, somebody mentioned that uh, Modi's uh, latest remarks on China are uh, to be viewed as a softening of stand. I don't think it's softening of stand. I think it's just the reiteration of sorts, which says that India would like to have, uh, you know, stable relations with all its neighbors. I mean, India has always risen up to that occasion. One of the things that you did not mention out there is that under the second term of the Modi government, you also saw a kind of a revisiting and a kind of a reiteration, the refocusing on the neighborhood, right? So when Sri Lanka was in problem, mm. I mean, because of all these uh, strange loans and all these uh, very exploitative loans by, by China, it was India that rose up to the occasion, okay? So we have kind of, you know, very systematically, very uh, pragmatically maintained that we would like to have a stable relationship uh, with our neighbours, but at the same time, right, I mean, we also have the global aspirations, and why not? But as you say, we could have whole other episodes on any one of these issues, and we surely will, as we, as we have in the past, but we are going to have to close the conversation there. There's so much more we can, we can dive into, and you've both brought up so many interesting points as we go into the Indian election, uh, which we'll be touching on over the next several weeks as it unfolds. About six weeks. Thanks so much to our guests. We had Swasti Rao. She's an associate fellow at the Europe and Eurasia Center at the Manoa Paraka Institute for Defense Studies, which is part of India's Ministry of Defense. And she came to us from New Delhi. And Dr. Shitich Bajpai, he is Senior Research Fellow for South Asia in the Asia Pacific Program at Chatham House. He had joined us from London. So to summarize, I think things are going to remain the same. We're going to see a continuity of the foreign policy, no matter what the result of the elections Maybe. Right. I mean, what we heard, there does seem to be consensus in India about India's role in the world and growing that role and trying to be that friend to everyone. But as we also heard, it's going to be interesting to see if India, whether it's under Modi or anyone else, can really maintain that friend of, to everyone. Because in a world of great security risks, someone out there needs to, would might be a threat to you. Uh, so you might not be able to be friends with everyone. And balancing that is going to be, I think, for me, is very interesting to watch. So we can ask our listeners, our viewers, what do you think about it? If you're watching us on YouTube, do let us know your thoughts. What do you think about India's foreign policy? Is there going to be continuity? Are there going to be any changes? What kind of changes would you expect? Do let us know. And if you're listening to us on Spotify or wherever you get your podcast, do leave us a review. I'm Isha Bhatia Sanan. I'm senior editor here at Deutsche Welle. And I'm William Klukraft, security reporter at DW. Goodbye. Global Eyes, a new take on security policy by DW.